we'll go ahead and get started. I hope everyone's staying warm and safe wherever you are at today. And if you'd like, just chime in and let us know where you're uh, reporting from today. I'm in Colorado and we woke up to eight inches of surprise snow today, but thankfully we have lots of heat and water. So we're very thankful. Today's webcast is, uh, let me jump ahead here, learning from the pandemic to improve digital learning outcomes. And my name is Megan. I drag programs and events here at WCET. And we will be recording this webinar and make it available as soon as possible. Captions are also available, so you can select that option if you'd like to follow the subtitles. As we go through, if you have any questions for our panelists today, enter them into the Q&A, and we'll be sure to get to those as soon as we can. You can access the slides, and we'll post that link in the chat box. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you'd like to follow along, that hashtag is WCET Webcast. Today's webinar is hosted in partnership with Guild Education and VITAC makes the captions available. Again, any questions can be posted to the Q&A, preferably not in the chat because sometimes we lose track of the discussion taking place over there. We have a wonderful moderator today who's thankfully able to chime in from Texas. She's one of the fortunate ones with heat and water. So I'd like to go ahead and pass it off to our moderator today, Shante Rakasner, who's the Dean for Academic Success at Northeast Lakeview College. Welcome, Shante. Thank you, Megan. And thank all of you for chiming in and joining us. And yes, I am eternally grateful that I'm able to join you today. Um, I am fortunate um, to have power and water. And I just ask that for a second, um, if you have any time in your day to just send some good energy, warm energy, electric energy, love and light to all those of us in Texas who are um, struggling with this, with this winter. Um, uh, we'll have, well, a little bit about myself. Um, I started my career in the community college sector 15 years ago at Cincinnati State Technical and Community College, where I was an English professor. Um, I stayed there for um, about 12 years and transitioned into administration um, by way of faculty development. So the topics for today and, and my focus as an administrator is, um, is very much about securing, you know, access and equity and, and uh, teaching and learning and making sure that we're providing the utmost support for faculty and students um, in this journey in higher education. So got some amazing panelists, guest panelists with us, um, and I'll have them introduce themselves, but and we'll start with Mr. Michael Horn, uh, author and senior strategist uh, from Guild Education. Hey, thanks so much. It's great to be with you all uh, today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a senior strategist at Guild Education. Uh, our mission is to uh, provide the education and upskilling for America's workforce to help them realize opportunity. Uh, before that, I uh, was with uh, the Entangled Group, uh, and before that was the co-founder of the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation. And as mentioned, I write a lot of books on uh, the future of education, my most recent being Choosing College. Thank you, Michael. And Michael is joined and we are joined by Michelle Levine, who is District Director of Faculty Development at Broward College. Michelle, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Levine. As Shantae said, I am the District Director of Faculty Development at Broward College in our Center for Teaching Excellence and Learning. And we are in South Florida. So um, sending our warm weather <laughs> and our warm air your way. Um, we're, we're about 85 and sunny today. So we're very fortunate. Um, I had the, the pleasure of um, serving in our Center for Teaching Excellence and Learning and working with our faculty and our staff in professional development. And it's been just an absolutely amazing journey. I actually, um, I'm for 25 years in education, I started out as a high school uh, math and computer science teacher and then transitioned into higher ed about 20 years ago. And in my heart, I will always be faculty. Um, I like to say that I never uh, will ever stop teaching. I, I still teach every semester. And now I am lucky enough to teach not only the students, but my colleagues as well. So I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Before we jump into the discussion with our panelists, um, we wanted to give you an opportunity to just see what you all are saying about 
transitioning to online learning right now. So if you can take a look at this word cloud, um, as you can see, some of the more dominant words are actually, um, you know, pretty, pretty positive. Um, we've got growth, we've got accessible. Um, yes, there are things like exhausting, um, but that's also partnered with enlightening. Um, in today's discussion, we're gonna focus on trying to unpack and unravel some of these challenges um, that you all are facing, uh, and we'll attempt to give you some strategies um, to help navigate this time. So our goals for today, understanding the unique challenges that exist in the digital, digital learning and what success what, sex, what successful online learning and engagement actually looks like right now. Um, lessons learned during COVID-19 remote teaching and engagement, and then strategies for post-pandemic teaching and learning. Next slide. So COVID-19, in this journey, I'm sure many of you have had to navigate conversations about um, online learning and distinguishing emergency remote education from online learning. Um, so as you can see here, one of the things that we've uh, acknowledged is that emergency remote education is not the same as online learning. 60% um, of students who previously learned uh, at least partially in person before the pandemic report a decline in their quality of education. I know at my institution, I've, I've often used the term quality online learning, but we're here today to try to give you some emphasis and some support with ensuring or, or assuring quality in emergency remote learning as well. Um, but in this time, Black and Latin, uh, Latinx students are more likely than their white peers to say COVID-19 is very likely or likely to impact their ability to complete their degree. And 15% of working adult students report difficulty with format um, as their top challenge in persisting. So we see we want to make sure we're addressing issues related to equity um, and access to success in these, uh, in, in these times. Next slide. In a recent report by Titan Partners, Time for Class, there were some, there's some facts that we'd like to center um, in this discussion. So um, the highlights that faculty experience in introductory courses are noted here. So faculty report greater challenges teaching in hybrid and high flex formats relative uh, to fully face-to-face -face or online formats. Uh, they report an increased exposure to digital learning practices and tools um, has positively altered their perception of online learning and prompted enduring changes in teaching and learning, um, the teaching and learning landscape. Faculty also continue to report that engaging students in their top instruction is their top instructional priority, followed by providing timely feedback, increasing student collaboration, and grading. Next slide, please. So here's a visual representation of the challenges that have been reported by faculty in introductory courses, noted, noting that keeping students engaged is a top priority for faculty. So here's what we believe is evident when online learning is done right. So um, McKinsey Global Institute forecasts um, that there's going to be an increase, 82 to 91% in online learning uh, after the pandemic. So we should look forward to that. Um, increase in enrollment um, and increasing in accessibility and outcomes. So Strata's latest COVID-19 work and education survey shows that six in 10 Americans now prefer either an online or hybrid option, even if COVID-19 weren't a threat. Um, I'm sure some of you while you're working from home are thinking about ways that your work, your working from home space is being um, enhanced uh, by this, uh, this opportunity or you're getting a greater perspective for how to work from home by this, uh, this phenomenon. New or increased revenue streams for institutions are possible. So additional program offerings are increasing with online when quality online learning is done. Um, oh, and it opens doors to new populations, including um, 60 million adult learners with education benefits. And then there's ultimately the improved learning outcomes for students. So 
this is really the sort of impetus for us looking at, we are experiencing these challenges, but there's incredible opportunity for us if we're actually um, taking the time to do online learning with quality, deliver online learning with quality. So we're gonna have our panelists offer their thoughts and their experiences um, related to teaching online in this time and what they think about the ways we can move forward with greater success with this online learning platform. So let's start with Michael. Michael, give us your thoughts on what's happening right now um, with the pandemic and ways that we can think about moving forward with greater success. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the uh, opportunity and, 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 and the framing you provided up front also. I, you know, I, I think the first thing to say, right, is that uh, if you had done the thought experiment exactly 12 months ago, would America's colleges and universities be able to pivot so rapidly overnight uh, to this remote learning and, and using online technology? And would faculty be able to make the extreme adjustments that they've had to make under extreme duress in their own personal lives? There would have been a lot of people who were not sure it would have happened. And so I, I, I just think the first thing to always say in these conversations is that the American higher education system for all of the things that are said about it sometimes uh, did an amazing job uh, in moving extremely rapidly to this new and unfamiliar format for huge swaths uh, of our institutions and faculty. And so I, I think that's just first a, a, an observation that I've had is that the pivot that was made does not get nearly enough credit uh, in, in, in my judgment. The, the second thing I, I would say as a principle is that having looked at online uh, learning in both higher education and K-12 uh, for, for the last couple decades, one of the findings that is extremely consistent is that it's done best when it's viewed really as a team sport, as opposed to an individual faculty member trying to do the entire thing themselves remote uh, from their students. And that uh, that can take a variety of forms, right? Uh, we see some extraordinary uh, examples like Western Governors University, for example, that's been doing this for a long time, uh, where they create a team faculty model in essence, where there's content experts that are helping to shape the course, there are learning designers who are actually building courses, there are uh, coaches both for the course that are helping delivery and actually the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, work. There's also uh, success coaches similar to what we provide uh, at Guild Education to make sure students are persisting and getting the support outside of their learning that they need uh, to do a great job and that they have assessment professionals uh, as well. Uh, and, you know, that's one version uh, of it, of course, but that notion that you have a team of people that bring different expertise that can fill in different gaps to provide a web of support uh, for students, uh, I think is an incredibly important concept uh, in, in, in all of this. Uh, and then the th just the third thing I would note uh, as sort of overview, and then I'm excited to dig in uh, more is, you know, the real opportunity, I think, for uh, learning anywhere is to create an active learning experience where students are actively engaged and they're making sense of the material. They're not in a passive format. There's a lot of research uh, around the importance uh, and, and just the benefits of active learning. And, and that can look differently, right? It can be asynchronous in certain cases where students are just rapidly answering questions and thinking through and doing projects and things of that nature on their own and assimilating information. It can be synchronous with really robust seminars and conversations and group discussions and things of that nature. But using online medium to accelerate the use of active learning, uh, I think is an incredibly important design principle in all of this, rather than sort of defaulting to a passive lecture uh, type of format that I would argue it doesn't work great in person. The reason we sort of tolerate it is it works well with credit hour and seat time regulations. Uh, and you can pass the class, but it works even less well uh, in an online and distance format where there's so many distractions that students have in their lives uh, and just at their computer screens uh, that can make it really challenging for faculty members uh, to create uh, that, that contained and robust experience. So anything you can do that creates active learning opportunities and frankly, accountability for the students so that they need to be present and partaking, uh, I think is an incredibly important design principle as well. Thank you, Michael. Michelle, why don't you chime in and give us your thoughts on the ways institutions can support um, instruction, quality teaching and learning right now? Yeah, so I think that this year, um, as you said, it, it's given us such a great opportunity. So really early on, we kind of, um, when we realized that we were gonna be pivoting and going 
remote, um, we, we really quickly jumped into gear and, and really started thinking about how can we support our faculty and our staff in this. Um, I, I, I like to think of this as, as a completely imperfect, perfect world that we're living in now so that we've really humanized and, and normalized imperfection and, and our realness and, and humanness, right? And so um, it's really been amazing. I agree 100% with Michael that it's really just kudos to our entire higher education in general. My, my kids are all in the K through 12 system and their teachers are doing a phenomenal job as well. So, you know, kudos to all of us as educators for being able to pivot and to um, really infect and adapt as necessary and to be willing to do what it takes to support our students. Um, I, I think so many amazing things have come out of this. Um, as your, your study showed, you know, I think even once we are not forced to be in a remote situation, I think we found that there's a lot of benefits to remote learning, um, remote advising. Our advising numbers are up higher than they've ever been since we've gone remote, giving these opportunities to students to be able to meet with their professors uh, virtually so they don't have to go onto campus and maybe take hours out of their day just for a 20 minute conversation with one of their professors. So there's really been just a lot of opportunity. And from a training perspective, we kind of, so I remember vividly getting the notice that we were going remote on March 12th. And then March 13th, that morning, we started offering back-to-back -back sessions in um, schools. So how do you actually do this? Because you know that was the number one thing is just getting people up and running to be able to uh, teach and, and work remotely and using the tools and, and um, whether that's Zoom or at the time we were using Blackboard Collaborate um, and really just getting people comfortable with the tool itself. And now, you know, it's been amazing to see the, the transition into, you know, going from just learning the tools to really how do we use those tools and what are some of the research-based best practices to really maximize the use of those tools. And the active learning has been a huge part of it. You know, having the students feel engaged just because we're not in the same room with each other doesn't mean we can't really feel close to each other, build that sense of community and let the students know that we're there for them and that they're part of part of the team. I love that, that analogy. So yeah, I, I think, you know, this concept of engagement, it isn't a new concept that faculty is wrestling with, right? So even during this pandemic, you know, we're, we're, we're challenged by this teaching format and figuring out strategies for engagement. But, but this was a reality, right? Questions about how do we best engage students were a reality for face-to-face -face instructors um, even prior to this moment. So I'm wondering what, you, what both of you might think about how do we sustain, right now we have even some of the most um, I'll say um, seasoned instructors at our institutions who have their strategies and their approaches, they're even engaging new and innovative approaches to trying to do this work and do it well. What are your thoughts about how we sustain that level of energy and, and inquiry in the teaching practice? Yeah, so I have some thoughts about that. So, you know, I, I, it's interesting looking at the word cloud and, and we were even discussing right before we started how many positive words are in there, opportunity and exciting and, and words like that. But we also see a lot of exhaustion. People are just tired, right? It's been, it's been a long year. Um, so one of the things we really have been trying to focus on is how do we work smarter and not harder? And I think that this has given us that opportunity to do that. So um, strategies like creating micro videos that can be used for not just this class, but classes to come, right? In multiple classes flipping the classroom. So even when we do go to a live environment or any modality, that strategy still works really, really well to have students watch micro videos outside of class and then engage with them in class. Um, sorry, I, <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. But, but yeah, so I think that, um, you know, working smarter and using things like intelligent agents in the learning management system so that we can reach out to students and keep them engaged and um, even, you know, make it in, in a way that it's personalized for each student. So we're reaching out not just to those students who are struggling, but sometimes we hear from the ones that are doing well, especially in an online environment, you know, I haven't heard from my teacher, I'm getting an A and they feel like, you know, hey, I'm here too, you know, so, you know, finding ways to, to um, reach out and, and 
recognize all of the students, even the ones that, that are doing well and using things like those intelligent agents that you know, will send out, um, you know, great job, you just got a, an A on your exam, you know, things like that. So really trying to think of ways to um, keep that energy level up by working smarter and not harder. Yeah, I, lo I, I love that uh, notion, smarter, not harder. I think it's a great, uh, sort of a great way to banner uh, a lot of the things that we ought to be thinking about. J just to put a, you know, sort of a plus one, if you will, uh, to what Michelle said up front in, t in terms of uh, being able to create artifacts that can get reused across different courses, uh, but even just being able to leverage a lot of existing resources that are already out there. I, I, you know, for example, the Coursera videos uh, and their campus product that I know a lot of uh, schools were perhaps suspect of before, and now all of a sudden are saying, hey, I can use a couple snippets here and there, not the whole, you know, sequence, right? But that modular notion to me is a really important one of being able to reuse materials as it makes sense. And I think schools can do a lot to support faculty uh, by creating uh, databases or libraries uh, of those resources so that it's easy to find them, right? That I don't have to catalog it all myself to say, oh, there was that great three minute clip or that great you know, two minute simulation or whatever it is, that it's easily findable I think is, is, is important. Which relates, I, th I think, to the second notion, and I keep coming back to this online as team sport, but really teaching as team sport. I, anything we can do to take burden off of faculty to having to do it all, I think, is incredibly important. And this is where I think beefing up instructional design and, and um, uh, understanding of learning science uh, in, inside of the support functions of colleges and universities is so important so that whenever we're putting together a course, you've got support behind you who are thinking, okay, what are the objectives? How would I know and assess? Okay, now how do I put the material and content together in the most engaging way to accomplish the outcomes that I want for students uh, is just sort of a process that you follow as opposed to you have to band-aid it together uh, each time because that can create a lot of stress. And, and, and then the third thing I think is, it's been said to me that you know master teachers uh, you, you almost imagine them like artists in their studio and, and in their classrooms when they did their work really well, they sort of have a tableau of tools that they can go to, right? They, they go to this trick or they go to this tool or whatever else. And we've all of a sudden put them and said, nope, that's, you, you can't use that anymore. Here's your new tableau. Well, the really cool thing is you take home a bunch of new tricks, right? Of things that you can do to create more engaging uh, active learning experiences, ideally, and just I, you don't have to hang on to all of them, right? If you go back to a face-to-face -face environment, for example, but just a couple of them in terms of how you would flip the classroom and use the time together, for example, or, or just little things like that, uh, or some of the nudges that Michelle's talking about around, you know, uh, using technology tools to do the uh, encouragement when someone uh, uh, did something or, or using some of what we know from behavioral sciences to say, hey, you know, all your classmates just submitted this along with you. You're part of the crowd. Good job, right? Um, that sort of thing, I think, can do uh, wonders. And so taking some of those tricks of the trade and codifying them, I think, is really important. Yeah, and I want to dive in a little bit on, um, on your analogy to team sports, right? So especially because you brought up this relationship between instructional designers and faculty. Um, and I think some of the most profound teams, you know, those, mem those memorable teams, those teams that have legacies of winning, you've got role players and people who know and understand their roles, right? And so you get that synergy that brings victory, right, ultimately when the game is played. And so I wonder what your thoughts are, both of you actually, what your thoughts are on how to help everyone understand their roles in the support and in, 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 on the team, right, with advancing quality instruction, um, particularly in these moments. Um, and, and, and I ask this question because we know instructional design units, right, uh, typically are um, small at institutions. And so you're fortunate if you've got a, a robust sort of um, uh, cadre of instructional designers. Um, I know at Northeast Lakeview College and throughout our district, we've got a team of instructional designers, but at my institution, for instance, I've got two on-staff instructional designers to support all of our faculty, right? Um, and so how do, we, how do we have conversations? How do we grow 
intelligence about quality instruction as more than just the faculty's responsibility, but also more than just the instructional designer's responsibility. So how do we start to push that narrative about everyone's role in, in, in assuring quality in instruction? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, I, I often call our instructional design team one of our best kept secrets at the college. I think a lot of the faculty don't even realize that they have that support. And so we've really been trying, especially this past year, to um, advertise those that team. We are very fortunate. We do have, you know, we have a large institution. So, you know, it's relative, but we do have a nice instructional design team. Um, they're kept very busy. But, you know, we have really been trying to let our faculty know, you know, hey, this, this team is here to support you. You know, you're the content expert, but they can help you make it happen. So if you have this idea, maybe you want to do self-checks throughout your, your chapter in your, your course, but you don't know how to do that, that's what they're there for. They're there to help you or to get your tests, you know, working with test banks and things like that that they might not realize. Or how do I caption a video or create an accessible video, you know, things like that. Um, so I think those kinds of things really stress a lot of professors out. Like they, they want to be doing those things, but they don't know how. And I think that's where we need to leverage the instructional design team and really make sure that there's conversations there and, and to work together and collaboratively. We actually are very fortunate with our CARES funding right now. We're developing um, over 300 courses actually to go online using the, the CARES funding. And it is a huge team effort. Not only do we have our internal faculty um, subject matter experts and then our instructional designers from our college, but we also have an a external company we're working with and they're working as a team to make sure that quality courses are getting developed um, moving forward because we know that online instruction is just gonna continue to grow and grow and grow. And it's, it's not just, you know, so we call remote uh, for us, online um, is the term means um, asynchronous. So if you're taking an online course, it means it's an asynchronous course. Um, remote is you meet virtually during a, a regular scheduled period. And then of course we have the hybrid, which is kind of a, a mix between the two. So, you know, I think, you know, remote, blended, hybrid, they're all going to be staying for forever, I think. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I uh, so a lot of good points there. And, and Shante, I also love the uh, analogy and the and the questions uh, about the the role players and the importance of that in in building a team. I think it's uh, such a great observation. Um, one of the things that you know, as I've studied organizations more broadly, that we see is that as organizations mature processes, ways of solving recurrent problems emerge uh, and they become very sticky. It's really, that's where culture in an organization tends to live is in your explicit and implicit uh, processes and priorities. And historically, you know, at a lot of institutions, faculty haven't had that support, right? So they have had to do it on their own. And that process, if you will, has been built up uh, whereby, the, you know, to Michelle's point, they feel like, gosh, I would love support for X, but like, I don't know how to do it. And I think I have to do it all because I don't know about what's uh, uh, open to me in many cases. And so I, I think in some ways, if we can start to flip and be intentional about crafting default processes that actually involve the instructional designers, as opposed to making them sort of the, oh, if you need help option, uh, I think would be a big step uh, forward. It's, it, you know, in the same way uh, you get employees to uh, give and uh, get matches for their 401ks by making it the default option, make the instructional designers part of the course design as the default. And then, you know, if the faculty have a better idea, obviously they have the academic freedom uh, to, to pursue that and, and they can go that direction. But, but I think re-engineering those processes of course creation uh, is a big step I would take. The, the second observation I have is just in regards to your point that a lot of institutions don't have very big uh, instructional design teams and it's a real challenge. This is where I would look to uh, institutions to find more partnerships with each other uh, to use and leverage these resources across. I, I mean, we know in higher education uh, that partnering and creating uh, uh, creative collaborations uh, between institutions is gonna be an important part uh, of, of just how we operate in the future. Uh, and I think this is an easy place where 
uh, we can share these resources across institutions to give everyone more support. Because the reality is you don't have to rethink every single class every single year, right? There's a refresh rate and so forth to it. Um, and, and you can spread those resources out, I think, across institutions so that everyone has uh, s some really good support behind them so they don't have to do it all on their own because it's really hard. Yeah, one of the things that we've really been um, trying to um, promote is UDL, Universal Design for Learning. And actually, Michael used the term before plus one. Um, so that's actually a, a UDL principle so that, um, you know, as we try to make our courses more accessible, sometimes it can be really, really overwhelming. You know, how do I redo my entire course? But, but using that plus, plus one principle of what's one more way that I can engage my students or assess my students or have them express themselves. And um, sharing those ideas is, is crucial. I think that, you know, we have um, at Broward College, we started a remote learning uh, community of practice where the faculty can share amongst themselves. And then um, I'm really proud of a, of a collaboration that we started. So um, I had spoken with the team about AQ before we, we had you know, today's session. So AQ is the Association of College and University Educators. And we actually had partnered with them prior to going remote last, last year. And it really helped us that we had that relationship before we um, had to pivot because the professors who had gone through the course really felt equipped to use these strategies in their classroom. And so now what we've done is um, actually, I think Dr. Robson's on the call with us today, Dr. Jody Robson from Indian River State College had this idea to get together other institutions who were also AQ partners and have us form a collaborative. And so we have been meeting now, we, we actually have our fourth um, session plan for, for next week where we get together with, it started out with five institutions in South Florida, or in Florida, actually. And now it's um, from all over the country, we have people coming and joining us and discussing best practices and collaborating together. And it's just been phenomenal because sometimes, you know, we get stuck in our silos of, you know, what we're just doing, not just in our own classroom, but maybe within our own discipline. And, and sometimes it's nice to hear what other colleges are doing, what other disciplines are doing and sharing those ideas. Um, again, going back to that team, you know, we, we say all the time, you know, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. You know, we all have the same common goal and um, not, no one of us can do this by ourselves. You know, we, we need each other and um, we grow from each other. So, so the collaborations have been extremely important. One other really quick idea that emerges out of that, actually, I think that's interesting is the notion of playbooks, right? And you were talking about practices that you can start to do. Uh, and so just keep extending this analogy, I guess, one step further. Well, at some point it'll break. But uh, the, uh, you know, the notion of playbooks that, you know, there, there's, you sort of build forms of building courses so that you are putting in the right practices as you put some things. So you don't always have to pull in another resource, but the way you construct a course, there's a clear uh, way to do it across uh, the university that you're relying on certain uh, uh, technologies or, or templates uh, that allow you to do it in rules-based ways just as a support. And again, you can break it because, you know, the pro you know, the problem with best practices is they work on average, but not, uh, you know, potentially in your uh, specific circumstance. But that's where you create, uh, you know, some flexibility around those templates. But just having that default, I, I think, is just ways to offload, frankly, the cognitive load on all of us right now. Yeah, I really love that, um, Michelle, your comments actually bring up how collaboration extends beyond the institution um, into, you know, networks, um, maybe in the state um, and even national networks that can help you, uh, you know, innovate and create and, and also sustain some of the work that you're doing um, at your institutions. Um, can both of you offer some thoughts about, um, you also brought up, Michelle, the, the funding needs uh, for instructional design, um, can can or for instructional design support, uh, course development support. Um, what are your thoughts about um, this idea of strategic collaborations to support um, the work that we're doing right now? Um, you know, we lots of institutions promote collaboration as like an institutional value, but how do you do it? Right, and I think sometimes faculty in particular, because they work in very siloed ways and they 
um, and, and the world of the department can even be insular, but how do you build those collaborative efforts um, across institutions, um, across states, in order to actually advance the most quality um, efforts in teaching and learning? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I think um, it, it requires reaching out, right, and, and reaching out to other institutions to see what they're doing. Um, you know, as Michael said earlier, there's a lot of great resources already out there that we can leverage. So um, I know that there's the, um, the Top Kit is a really great resource that's out there. Um, AQ has a lot of really free, great free resources that we can be using and, and um, leveraging. So, you know, when we first went remote and we wanted to be training our faculty, we said, you know, we're not going to reinvent the wheel right now. You know, let's see what's already out there because we wanted to get the training out there quickly. So we looked and saw, you know, what webinars are already available. There's a lot of recorded content already out on the web. So we took things that were already there and then kind of made it our own. So we would have our faculty and staff watch the webinar and then come together and, and have a discussion and reflect about it. Um, and just, I think, you know, really reaching out and seeing what other institutions are doing and connecting. And there's, um, there's uh, I can't think what it's called right now. I'm just drawing a blank, but there's a, a group, a, a group that I'm on. <laughs> Um, a pods or something. I, I can't think what it's called right now. POD, I think is what it is. Um, professional that, organization yes. development network. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. And that one has like hundreds and hundreds of people who are from different institutions connecting and sharing ideas. I remember when we first went remote and we're very, very fortunate. I think, you know, our secret sauce at Broward College is our team, our, our CTEL team. We're so fortunate. We have this amazing group of um, dedicated professional, you know, educators who are just positive and all want to, you know, we are all in it together and we support each other and we help each other. And we are so fortunate to have one another. I know some people out there and actually we call ourselves the wolf pack. So, but, and, and with that analogy, I know there's some people out there that are lone wolves and don't have that, that support. And so a lot of those lone wolves were reaching out on the POD and asking for help, you know, what do I do? Like, I'm completely blank slate right now. Like, I don't know how to even get started. And I remember jumping on some calls with some of these people, you know, get, typing into the, the chat and saying, here, just reach out, you know, let's just have a conversation. Let's just talk about what are some easy things that you can do now without having to develop tons and tons of content because there is content out there already. It's just a matter of how can you leverage that content that already exists. So I think just really talking to each other and being willing to share is is really important. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a ton to add to that. I think I think that's right. And you know, the other thing is, I think you can create formal partnerships in the way institutions uh, often do uh, for for shared services. And and this is an area where uh, if if you create those contracts essentially between colleges or leverage the networks that already exist, right? You know, when you're you're in a system, obviously, Shante, right, where you can do that across campuses, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that faculty know that this is a resource that we have. Again, you know, I keep coming back to make it the default <laughs> as opposed to the thing you stumble into uh, to the extent possible. But I, I, I just think that kind of creativity in terms of the way we formally work with each other is gonna be really important in the years ahead. I, we know the financial reasons uh, to do so given all the pressures uh, bearing down on colleges and universities from a cost uh, perspective. Uh, and this is a way I think you can do more with, you know, unfortunately with less in, in many cases. Uh, but I also think it's a creative way just to create more value uh, on, on the campuses and help all the stakeholders, faculty, students, uh, and, and, you know, the communities that we serve. Thank you. So we're going to jump into the Q&A session right now and get questions from the participants. Uh, we did have a, um, a participant who submitted a question um, prior to today. So I want to give you all an opportunity to address that question publicly. Um, and so the question is, in the area of engaging students, how do we know the value of mandating virtual session attendance? Specifically, should we reward attendance of virtual video chat class sessions more or less than viewing recordings and completing assignments asynchronously? What are your thoughts about that? 
Yeah, I'll jump in first. I, I, you know, I think it depends on what the course outcomes are that you're desiring and what the learning objectives are for the students. Uh, to me, in general, measuring attendance is measuring the wrong end of the student and we want to look at the learning outcomes themselves. Um, but in certain courses, it's really important to do that because uh, for example, if it's all, you know, a lot of the learning occurs in the conversations and discussions between students, and that's part of the course design, then attendance and participation is absolutely critical. Otherwise, the course does not work. And so in that case, because it's tied to a key outcome uh, from the learning, I think it's incredibly important. And something that maybe is more asynchronous and more flexible, uh, like Michelle was describing uh, their online offerings, uh, are, you know, that's going to take a different uh, characterization. From my perspective, if you can jump into an assessment and show you already know it and, and perform great, great. I don't need you to, you know, just log on and watch the video for its own sake, but I want to actually see that you got the learning and that you can demonstrate the learning. Otherwise, you know, that is what I'm going to tell you as your instructor to go back into uh, those materials. So I get wary of one size fits all policies uh, ar around these things. I think those can become very dangerous for the innovation uh, on the ground of how you actually do the teaching and learning. Uh, but it, to me, it, it all comes back to what are the outcomes you want to achieve for your learners? Uh, and then what's the, um, there's an element of personalization for the learner as well. You know, if, if they're a novice, uh, in a course, a lot of interaction might overload their working memory, uh, but you want to make sure that they go through the fundamental material. So, you know, thinking through that is going to be important. If they're an expert uh, in a subject and sort of at the upper end of something, interaction is going to be incredibly important because they're going to learn from their peers uh, in, in some important ways and requiring that attendance may be a, an important part of the course design. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think, you know, like I said, we have some courses that are completely asynchronous and some that are synchronous. And um, I do personally, um, for every unit in my asynchronous course, I do a synchronous session with my students, but I make it optional because they haven't signed up for that. They've signed up for an asynchronous experience for a multitude of reasons. Some of them work crazy, crazy hours, and it's really difficult to mandate that they, you know, attend at a certain time. Uh, for our remote classes, there is that expectation that they're going to be there for the live classes. And I feel like that's where the active learning comes into play that, you know, when you design your, your classes, you should ask yourself that, you know, are, is there an added benefit for them coming to class? And there should be an added benefit for them coming to class. So, you know, for example, in, in my class that I just taught on Tuesday night, it definitely would have been a completely different experience to watch the recording than to actually be there. We were doing polling throughout. They had a team you know, um, assignment that they were working on. There are some things that, that I teach that I don't even care about the outcome of the project. I'm, the actual objective is the teamwork itself. You know, So I think it really depends on, on the course and the content. But if you're designing your lecture or your, your uh, synchronous time together well, then the students are actively involved and it's not the same experience as just watching a video back. Yeah, I think that's a really great, great point. It's really, a, the design becomes key in all of this, right? Um, so we have, a, we have a question from Mr. Kelvin Bentley um, and um, I think Michelle, if you could lead with a response to this, um, do we have a sense that colleges and universities will redefine their expectations for faculty work um, and or student work um, around remote, you know, remote operations? So in other words, will more schools allow their staff and faculty to work from home post the pandemic? What are your thoughts about what work looks like for higher ed staff and students? Yeah, so of course, you know, it's hard. I'm not the one who makes these decisions, <laughs> but I think that, um, like I said, I don't see these options going away. So I think that we have seen through the data and through the experiences and the, the feedback from our students that we found, we tapped into something that we didn't even know we were missing. So, you know, there's engagement, you know, as I said, with advising, um, office hours, you know, being able to have students who have work sometimes until the time that class starts. And so this gives them the opportunity, I'm done work, I can jump right onto my class instead of having that transition period of having to drive onto campus. So I think that we have learned that this is something that we should be offering to our students. And, and the same for our faculty and staff, you know, there are actually, some are 
wanting to stay home and some can't wait to get back, you know? I mean, I'm gonna share with you, my, my kids just ran through the front door and my heart just started racing because I thought that they were gonna be in school till two today. And of course, today they have an early release and um, I, you know, they have strict instructions to stay away, but my stress level definitely just shot up when I heard them walk through the door. So, you know, I think that it really depends on the situation. Everybody's in a different situation, but I think we've really seen that there's a lot of benefits from having that option. I personally would love to see like a hybrid option. You know, some days you're working from home, but you're still having that face-to-face -face interaction at some point. But um, that's, you know, I think gonna be a, an institution by institution decision they're gonna make. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's navigated more, um, it, it's more challenging to navigate those situations where you've got contract obligations and, um, uh, for instance, if there's a uh, collective bargaining um, at your institution in terms of what the faculty roles and identities are and how they perform their work, that's, that's something to take into consideration. Um, we've got another question, um, and Michael, maybe you can provide some thoughts on this, um, but particularly as a solution, um, where do we see online proctoring? Is it creating more problems and turning students off to learning, or is it really helping? That's a great question, Shante. It's something that well, I it was Sherry, a... Sherry Prupis. I think it's her. I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, but it was Sherry's <laughs> question, not mine. <laughs> so. No, well, I'm glad you brought it up because it's it's something that uh, was growing as a practice significantly right before the pandemic, but wasn't getting a lot of attention. And then all of a sudden, uh, in the face of this, uh, folks started raising some uh, questions, frankly, around the bias uh, of, of of some of these. Uh, tools and and is it discriminating against people? Uh, you, you know, based on uh, facial and surface characteristics that are not commensurate with their actual behaviors uh, on, on the ground. And so, the, you know, these are real concerns. I think that uh, we we've got to dig into and make sure that they're reliable. For, from my perspective, online proctoring. Uh, I, I would say writ large, it's been a benefit because it allows a lot of students to be able to show what they know uh, from a variety of settings and, and, it, and it opens up, uh, you know, learning performance and, and not just frankly in, in the classroom and uh, individual courses, but, you know, on, on, on major gating assessments uh, to, to career fields. I, I think there's a lot of positives in that. And we ought to be doing audits uh, of, of these tools to make sure that we're not getting false positives that can really derail uh, so someone's academic uh, or, or professional career afterwards. And just one word on that, because I think a lot of times uh, in these technology conversations, certain people get really excited about the artificial intelligence that will allow us to do X. Uh, and my only pushback sometimes is, I, I have many pushbacks against AI, but the one I'll, I'll, I'll do here uh, is that you know, when Netflix or Amazon uses it to better recommend a movie or a book or a product for you, if they improve the recommendation, you know, by like percentage points or decimals, that's a positive for them, right? It's relatively low stakes for us if they get it wrong as the user on that end. If you get a learning recommendation wrong or you make a judgment about someone cheating wrong, that can really derail someone's career unfairly or it can create a negative repercussion of their perception as a learner uh, that can be super negative. And so I, I just think we, we have to have a very, an extra bar for, for the negative uh, use cases when we start to use tools like that, that, that at least I have some concerns around. And wh while I'm bullish about the opportunity for online proctoring, uh, I'm more comfortable when, when there's a human being still overseeing it at the moment, uh, g given some of the uh, th things that we've seen surface that quite frankly, at least in my experience, we're not being talked about before the pandemic. Yeah, and one of the things that comes up in our conversations always when we talk about our, our online proctoring tools is just really considering other ways to assess your students with authentic ass assessment. So really considering, you know, is a multiple choice or objective test the best way to assess your students? And sometimes it's the only option and then you need to use that, that option. But really looking at the big picture and are there other ways to accomplish the learning objectives in your course without having to go that route, you know, some kind of authentic, um, you know, article that they, they turn in or something like that. Yeah, I think those are really good points. Um, so our, our audience is diving in a little bit more on the instructional designer relationship to faculty. 
Um, so we've got several questions that I'm gonna sort of um, uh, repeat as one. Um, so the, the relationship between instructional designer and faculty is um, a, a little bit sometimes of a, um, a misunderstood one, right? So as I mentioned before, the idea of who plays what role becomes really important. Um, and then there are historic, like legacy kind of dispositions that people have. So, you know, in some industries, uh, at some institutions, instructional designers feel like faculty are intimidated by their efforts, right? Because it's like the instructional designer is trying to tell me what to do. Um, in other institutions, you know, the, the faculty welcome instructional designers, but they feel like, you know, how do I access them? Like, where are they? Like, what, are they only good if I'm teaching, a, do I only use their services if I'm teaching an online course? Um, what about, you know, when I'm teaching face-to-face, -face, are they, should I think about them at all, right? Um, and then there's the idea of funding um, related to instructional design support, especially when you have a sort of lopsided number um, in terms of how many faculty to an ins per instructional designer, how can you get that best support? So how do you, what suggestions do you all have for, um, and I'm gonna ask if you could tailor this, maybe one of you give a suggestion about what administration can do. And then um, from a faculty standpoint, um, maybe what are some steps that faculty can take to start to build the kind of synergistic partnership between instructional design and instructor um, beyond just the um, sort of documenting it, making it intentional. What are some other steps that we can do to, to make this partnership um, uh, more synergistic, more, more, more effective? Uh, go ahead, Michelle. Okay, uh, so, so, so the one thing I, I would say up front is, you know, what, what you've basically uh, clarified and alluded to, Shante, I think, which is uh, role clarification uh, up front and, and, and who does what and what does that mean? Like defi fundamental definitions, right, of, you know, content expert, that means you know these things, right, and, and what's going to be taught and course objectives and all those, uh, you know, angle and argumentation and, and, and all of those things are, are, are your call, right? Uh, but how we accomplish those goals, um, I wouldn't say, you know, it, it's just an instructional designer's call alone, but that they're gonna have expertise in that and clarify uh, that. And, and I, I think in many cases, this is just education on our campuses of just helping people know that there's a huge body uh, of research on the science of learning uh, that continues to make some really exciting progress right now. Uh, and that we have a lot of this information and instructional designers are increasingly being equipped uh, with, with this information as a support so that we make sure that learners um, are, 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 you know, that you're not just teaching, but that your students are actually learning uh, on the other side. And to me, I, I, I think that having that clarity of definition and then working through case studies is actually incredibly important so that we can take the emotion out of it when it comes your time to get to work with an instructional designer, if you will. You've sort of seen it uh, play out before and you have a sense of, hey, this is what's likely gonna happen. And the other piece I would say is, as you start to partner, let's figure out a safe way for faculty to be able to name fears or points of friction that they anticipate up front in the process uh, so that you can build or work around it or build trust uh, uh, through the process. I, th I think, rather than just diving in and assuming everyone's going to know uh, what role you play on the team, uh, that's sort of what gets you into trouble because we can often assume a, a definition, you know, the definition of a word is two radically different things. Clarifying and, and, and taking the emotion out, I think is incredibly important. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, so um, I can tell you what, what we do at Broward College is it's a partnership from the beginning. So when a, a faculty member is going to develop a course, they're assigned a instructional designer to work with. And from they go through the entire process together. So from, from day one, it's, it's a collaboration throughout. Um, in addition to that, we have a training that we offer. It's a um, online, you know, in our LMS that we offer that's called Designing Quality Blended in Online Courses. And it goes through a lot of this research that, that Michael has talked about. And, and so really, again, you know, these are some best practices that you can be using. 
And so you're you're not it's, it's, you're not expected to be the instructional designer, but you're getting a nice background into it and understanding you know some of the the reasoning behind it and why you would do things a certain way. And then along with working with your instructional designer, and it's a process. Um, I think that the education piece of it is huge. You know, like Michael said, you know, educating faculty that a the instructional designer you know, the team is even there. And then I, and I want to also talk about what you said about, you know, they're not just there for the online and blended courses, you know, they're also there for the face-to-face -face or remote as we, we have it now. Um, and again, you know, I think that it's really, how do we let them know that that team is there, you know, whether it's, you know, here's what they can do for you, you know, here's how they can help you, um, or just, you know, assigning them. Every time you you have a course that you're going to be developing, just starting that partnership from the beginning. Yeah, so we have, there, there's a there's a question in the, um, in the Q&A about, um, Henrietta Siemens, thank you for sending the question, but while encouraging faculty to seek assistance from the ID team, how do you prioritize prioritize requests to maximize resources and support. And some folk have already been chiming in on this. And I think um, your comments thus far, Michael and Michelle have, have given some thought um, to that. Um, and I, I just wanna offer um, at, at NLC, as a part of Alamo College's district, I know that um, you know we do our best with our institutionally, we are limited in terms of instructional design support, but we have a system of instructional designers um, that are able to help us, but um, uh, we do our best to sort of incentivize quality um, more so than thinking about um, getting help on rebuilding your class, right? The idea is, you know, how do you support the growth of quality in your courses in general? Um, and shout out to uh, Luke Dowden, who's over our um, Alma Colleges online, um, but, but our our, our institution, our district is doing right now um, quality design challenges, right? So even to a degree using gamification language to try to get faculty involved. And, and I kind of wanted to, um, to talk about Michael's suggestion about a playbook, right? I think all too often faculty who are doing stuff really, really well um, don't create the playbooks that they should uh, in terms of sharing information with their colleagues, with other, with the instructional design team. Um, and so what can we do to get faculty and encourage faculty to share? You know, I think I'm putting my, my faculty development hat on, the scholarship of teaching and learning hat on, but what can we do to encourage faculty to share what's happening in their classrooms when they have um, these sort of excellent practices or they're seeing great outcomes from reinventing strategies that they've learned before, but they're doing it differently now. Um, how do we encourage more documentation, more playbook creation by faculty? So one thing that we did that was really fun is we, we called it a bird's eye view. And after we went remote, we started having these, um, it was a kind of a mix between a webinar and a podcast, if you can picture the format, but um, because we gave them an opportunity to actually share their screen, but it was mostly in a podcast type of format, um, but we wanted them to be able to show some of the things in the ways that they were using the technology. But we highlighted um, a faculty member from each, we're an academic pathway institution, so we highlighted a faculty member from each of our eight um, academic pathways, and we called it a bird's eye view, and it was really fun and um, you know, the work that the faculty are doing is phenomenal. You know, they're, they're just so innovative and so creative. And I think that we have to find more and more ways to, to show that work, to showcase that work. Um, like I said, we also had the community of practice, I think is a really great way to have faculty share ideas and share what they're doing, um, sharing in their department meetings and their pathway meetings, you know, and really encouraging all of that um, is really, really important because all it takes is one person to tell, give you a good idea and it gets your mind thinking, oh, I can use that for, for this class or I can do that, but I'm going to make it even better by doing this, you know, and, and things like that. And, um, you know, and now, as I said, you know, we have the coffee shop where we're actually doing this across institutions where we're sharing some of these great ideas. So I think it's really amazing the work that's being done and um, we need to 
find as many ways as we can to highlight those faculty. Well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Michael, for your contributions to the discussion. I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan um, to wrap us up and close us out. Great, thank you so much, Shante. This was, this was excellent, and I wish we could have answered all the questions. We just had a couple that we didn't get to. Um, for those of you that are new to WCT, visit our website and learn more about the resources that we provide. We have a lot of great content that was referenced today and you can learn more about joining our community. We'd also like to direct you to Guild. They have tremendous research and resources on their website as well. And we will be sending out the link to the recording as soon as possible. So be sure to share that with your colleagues. I'd also like to give you a heads up that our upcoming leadership series will be announced more uh, in depth in the next week or so. We're building out that program and make sure to save April 6th and May 4th for a two topic series. I'd like to acknowledge all of our partners that help underwrite our events and programs here at WCET and our WCET supporting members. And thank you to our wonderful, wonderful panelists, very thoughtful discussion. And I think we're all re-energized to keep doing this hard work that we've been doing over the year. And thank you all to um, those that participated today, I really appreciated that you took time to do the word cloud too. I think that helped really kind of shape the experience overall. So we'll see you on the next event. Thanks everybody.